Thanks for coming. I'm Lori Young. I'm the director of the Wilderness Institute here at the University of Montana. This is the Conservation and Climate Change Lecture Series, co-sponsored by the Wilderness Institute and the Climate Change Studies Program, and supported by a grant from the Cinnabar Foundation. Tonight, we will hear from Ray Rasker, who will talk about climate change economics, solutions to the growing costs of protecting homes from wildfire. Ray's gonna speak for about 50 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions until about 8.30. Students in the group, you know that you're required to stay until 8.30. If you're here as a member of the public, uh, please join us till 8.30 if you can. If you have to leave early, I'd like to ask that you leave quietly because we're filming for local television broadcast. We hope that you will join us next week for our final lecture in the series. Erica Zavaleta will be speaking next Tuesday on March 22nd. She's an ecologist from the University of California, Santa Cruz, who will be talking about building resilience and how resilience approaches can really revolutionize the way that we think about ecosystems and the way that we do conservation in the context of climate change. She's a great speaker, and I think you will really enjoy her talk. I have a quick announcement from the student group UM Can Climate Action Now. Uh, they have a petition supporting the EPA's ability to regulate greenhouse gas emissions, and they will be located after the lecture out these doors, either inside or outside. They'll have a couple of students available. If you're interested in learning more about their petition or wish to sign the petition, of course, talk with them after the lecture. And now I have the pleasure of introducing Ray Rasker who joins us from Bozeman, Montana, where he's the executive director of Headwaters Economics, a nonprofit research group who's with a mission to improve community development and land use decisions in the West. Headwaters Economics works with rural communities, members of Congress and state legislatures, the Forest Service and the BLM, academic institutions, and other nonprofits. And their goal is to give these different stakeholders the information that they need to make good decisions and solve problems. Headwaters Economics has worked on the economic value of protected lands, the effects of climate change on the recreation economy, the rise of clean energy in the West, and policy guidelines for controlling the costs of protecting homes from wildfire, the topic Ray will be speaking about tonight. Ray himself has written extensively on rural development and the role of environmental quality in economic prosperity, in particular here in the Western US. Before joining Headwater Economics, Ray worked as senior economist for the Sonoran Institute, as an economist for the Wilderness Society, and as an adjunct faculty member at Montana State University. He has a PhD in economics from the College of Forestry at Oregon State University, a master's in agriculture from Colorado State University, and a bachelor's of science in wildlife biology from the University of Washington. He was born in Canada to Dutch parents and was raised in the Netherlands, Costa Rica, and in Mexico City. Now a US citizen, he likes to ride his mountain bike and tells us that he will be riding Pipestone, which is just east of Butte, or just west of Butte, right? East no, of east of Butte, Butte yes. Um, on his way home tomorrow, and that you are all welcome to join him. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Ray Rasker. Uh, thank you. Um, I guess I was gonna do a mic check, but I, this sounds really loud. Is it really loud? Is it okay? Can you guys, can you hear me back there? Just right? Great, thanks. And also this light is incredibly bright. <laughs> Um, sorry about all the technological problems we had. Um, let me just, oh, you know, I don't know what we did, but we fixed it. Don't anybody walk anywhere near the computer. <laughs> Send positive vibes to the computer. Um, sorry about that, that was a bit of a mess. Um, so I, I need to preface, uh, make a few caveats, a few remarks before I start. Um, the topic of this lecture series is climate change. Um, I'm not a climate scientist. Um, I actually don't know much about it um, other than what I'm about to tell you and other than what like the average interested person what I've read. I'm not a climate scientist. I'm also not a forester. Um, yet I'm going to talk to you about a forestry issue and I'm going to talk to you about climate science. Um, what I am as an economist, and what I spend a lot of time doing is thinking about incentives, incentives and disincentives. Um, often when we're confronted with human behavior that we can't explain, 
Um, it helps to think in terms of how are the incentives lined up. Also, are there any disincentives and how are they lined up? Um, I'm a real firm believer that economics is uh, a fascinating field of study. If you think of it as uh, the study of how people make choices in a constrained environment. So it's a social science and it's a science about how people make choices. So that's the area of my expertise. Um, also, this issue of the wildland urban interface uh, and climate change, we kind of bumped into it. Um, what we did is we produced a map, um, and we were mapping um, development, and we were trying to figure out where in the West were they developing more densely, and where were they developing more sprawled out. And I asked um, Patty Goody, who is, by the way, the, my, my colleague who did the bulk of this work, she lives in Helena, um, I asked Patty if she would strip in the public land boundaries next to um, where all the residential development was. And this is all exurban development uh, away from town, all the red dots. And I, I was kind of joking. I said, boy, if you were the Forest Service, this would be your, there's your work plan because this is where all the fires are going to be right next to public lands. That's how we kind of tripped into the subject. Um, we started asking ourselves, what does it cost to protect these homes that are built in harm's way? Um, what did it cost to protect this particular home? Um, at the same time, the Montana legislature, which meets every other year, had to meet out of cycle. They ran out of firefighting funds. And they approached us, and this is right as we were finishing our study, um, the first study that we did, and they said, would you do another study and figure out what does it cost to protect these homes? in Montana, and what is climate change going to do to that cost? Um, let me give you the big picture. Um, this is the national perspective. Uh, the federal government spends about $3 billion a year on wildland firefighting, um, double what it spent a decade ago. Um, when the Office of Inspector General of the Forest Service asked Forest Service managers, and they said, what portion of the firefighting cost is going to protecting homes? They said anywhere from 50 to 95 percent. Um, and we're going to get back to that topic in just a, a few minutes here. Um, what we discovered when we defined the wildland urban interface, or the WUI as it's called, is uh, 500 meters um, to the edge of forested public lands. We discovered that only 14 percent of it actually has homes on it. Another way to put that is the other 86 percent is potentially open for development. Um, we figured out, just the back of the envelope calculation, that if 50% of the wildland urban interface would develop, were developed, the cost of protecting those homes from wildfires would exceed the Forest Service's budget. So this is one of those kind of knock your out of your chair facts. We went, this is a big problem, this is a big issue, let's start researching it. Um, why should we care about this issue? Well, first of all, there's the opportunity cost issue. If you've got the Forest Service spending half of their budget or more, on wildland firefighting, much of it going to protecting homes. That means that's money that they're not spending on campgrounds, on scientific research, on restoration, a variety of other things. The other reason we should care is because sprawl is expensive. Um, I was on a graduate committee of a student at the University of Calgary who did the first ever Canadian cost of services study. And the cost of service study is where you look at the gross revenues from a new subdivision, and then you look at the cost of servicing that new subdivision, and you calculate what is the net revenue to the municipality from permitting a new subdivision outside of town. Um, out of all the studies she looked at, over 100 of them, every single one of them said the same thing. These far-flung subdivisions that are outside of town, they cost more than they generate in revenue. Uh, in Gallatin County, for every new dollar we get from a new subdivision in terms of property taxes, it costs us $1.45 to service that subdivision, the roads, the schools, the plowing, that sort of thing. So it's expensive, sprawl's expensive, it also impacts wildlife habitat, water quality, scenery. It's also not quite fair to the taxpayer. Only 4% of the homes that have been built throughout the West are actually inside the wildland urban interface. So it's not most of us who live there, it's just a handful of people. So what does it cost to protect homes from wildfire? Um, to put this into perspective, let's, let's look at the, the pattern of development in Montana over time, and I'll, I'll go by decade. So that's 1950, 1960, 1970, 
1980, the red dots all represent homes, 1990, 2000. Come on, computer. Uh-oh, that's a new one. 2006, <laughs> okay. I guess it takes 10 clicks for some of these. Um, and then 2006. Um, from, what are the dates here? From 1970 to 2006, our population increased by about 49%, but the acres of residential development increased by 200%. So our per capita consumption of land has grown significantly. Uh, the lots are getting bigger. Um, to give you a sense um, here locally what that looks like, um, these are net new developments per decade. So every red dot is a net new house during that period of time. So 55 to 65, everybody was building closer into town. The next decade, you could see people started building a little bit further out of town. 75 to 85, again, these are net new homes. People are building further and further away from town, and then the trend continues. So decade by decade, the pattern has been to build further and further away from the center of town. Um, so like I said, the Montana legislature, um, they ran out of firefighting funds. Um, the Montana doesn't budget for wildfire suppression. Instead, the um, Department of Natural Resources and Conservation, they pay for the suppression costs and then they have to reimburse it through some other fund. Um, it can come out of the general fund, but if it doesn't, um, the general fund has to balance, and if it doesn't balance, then they need to meet out of session and find a way to come up with additional funds. So that's the situation they had. Um, so what we did is we said, well, let's look at, at homes. We had a sample of 18 fires initially. We expanded the study to 30 fires. Some of the fires, like the Acorn Fire, uh, were uh, away from homes. Um, the, the, the blue uh, represents residential development. So some of them were backcountry wilderness fires, and some of them uh, were fires that were right close to homes. Um, the reason is, if you want to figure out um, what portion of the cost is attributable to homes you need in your sample fires without homes and fires with homes. Um, so the first objective was to uh, look at the historical data um, and we looked at f uh, fire perimeter initially. So for every fire on every day there are daily records for every single fire burned and um, as the fire burns and spreads um, we can tally up how many acres are burning. Uh, this fire, you can see, didn't involve a whole lot of homes. The second thing is to look at surrounding development. Uh, these blue dots represent homes that are within a mile of a fire. We also looked at homes that were two, three, four, five, six, all the way up to eight miles away from the edge of the fire. So as the fire progresses, you can look at the number of homes that start to become involved in the fire. Um, and then the next thing we looked at is total suppression costs per day. So you can see over there the cost will grow as the fire grows. And um, some of these fires, you could see as they progressed, the minute they started involving homes, you could see the fire costs just grow exponentially. So we knew there was a relationship. We just had to test this statistically. Um, then we also had to look at other things like weather, terrain characteristics, surrounding infrastructure. So from the Forest Service and from DNRC, we got these very large data sets that had um, quite a bit of information for every fire um, uh, for every day. Um, so statistically, we had a, a very nice large sample size, and we were able to actually track on every fire. You can see the variables change day by day. Um, what we found out was that it cost about $8,000 per home. That is within a mile of the edge of the fire to protect that home from wildfire. So when you look at all the things that firefighters are spending their time wrestling with, terrain, slope, that sort of thing, um, it, it ends up being about $8,000 per home or about $1,200 per home that is within six miles of the edge of the forest. Um, another way to look at this a little bit more accurate is to think of it per residential acre. It's about $664 um, dollars per residential acre. And the average lot size was 12 acres. So that's how we got $8,000 per home. 
What we found out was about 30% of the total firefighting cost was associated with protecting homes. Remember the Forest Service's Office of Inspector General said it was anywhere between 50 and 95%. Well, that was based on them asking managers and that was managers' best guess. Now we actually had a real number on it. So it's clearly not the only thing that causes firefighting to go up, but it's significant, it's a third. Um, so in the past, on average, Montana spends, in Montana, it costs about $28 million to protect homes from wildfire. Uh, the next thing to do was to look at future development, because this is something the Montana legislature also hired us to do, was to do a projection into 2025. So we said, okay, if building patterns continue the way they have in the last two decades, we projected where homes would be built. So um, the more pinkish color are the forecasted homes in the year 2025. And we found out, well, by 2025, if you don't do anything about land use planning and you continue to build homes in harm's way in f dangerous fire prone areas, it would add about $12 million to the cost. It would go up to $40 million. Now recall we had these daily fire records and we had quite a bit of data. And some of that data was climatological data. So we could go back and look at past fire records and try and figure out what happened when it was warmer. Um, you can see we had some years here where the total uh, area burned was significant. The estimated cost related to homes was also significant. What we did is we said, well, let's look at our, we looked at our daily cost estimates and we translated that into an annual cost estimate. And then we added temperature. Let's take a look at this one, for example. In 2000, it was about three degrees, a little bit, a little less than three degrees warmer. And you can see um, the, the acreage burned was significantly higher and of course the cost to protect the homes went up significantly as well. Um, if we sort these by temperature, so we have the lowest temperature, this is average summertime temperature, lowest temperature on the left, the highest temperature on the right, you can start to see a real pattern. Um, <clears throat> for these uh, five years, on average, it was about $1.8 million to defend those homes from wildfire. And in these years, on average, it was about 42.5. So the relationship looks a bit like this. Uh, a one degree increase Fahrenheit results in about a 305% increase in area burned. And you can tell it's not a linear relationship, it's actually exponential. A one degree increase and average summertime temperatures um, results in a 107% increase in the cost to protect homes. So this is the figure we presented the Montana legislature with. Basically said in the past you're spending about $28 million to, to defend these homes. If you don't do anything about land use planning it could go to $40 million. But if it gets one degree warmer it could, it could double to $84 million or more. Um, now, this is where I could get in trouble with the climate scientists. I, and I, I gave a talk like this at the National Home Builders Association um, a few months ago. And uh, I got approached immediately by a climate scientist who said, well, it's not the one degree. It's all the things that come with that one degree. And, and, and he was right. It, it's, you know, was there higher wind speed? Did the rainfall pattern change? Was there less snowpack? Was there more desiccation, more disease, more weeds, more invasives? That, that's all possible. Um, and, and this gets into a different subject. <laughs> but communicating climate change, it's really easy to get into all sorts of crazy detail and miss the policy point you're trying to make. And the policy point we're trying to make is this one. This is the growth trajectory we're on. Only 14% of the wildland urban interface has homes in it. We're gonna get more development and it is going to get warmer and this is the growth trajectory we're on. The federal government spends $3 billion a year. It's going to get a lot worse, okay? Unless we do something about the pattern of future development. Um, so who pays for this bill? Um, on the issue of incentives, well, a DNRC pays for some of it, the Montana Department of Natural Resources and Conservation. The Forest Service, the BLM, uh, they send firefighters in. 
Um, and then uh, the NRC, on average, uh, I think they spent about $106 million over the last four years. They can uh, ask for reimbursement, and on average, about 44% gets reimbursed by FEMA. So the bulk of the costs are paid for by the federal government. Most of the costs, hardly any of the costs, I should say, almost none of the costs are paid for by local municipalities who make the land use decisions. So the federal taxpayer is footing the bill for this. Um, we're also doing a study in California at, in the, all the, the forests of the Sierra Nevada. Uh, a similar finding, about 32% of the firefighting cost goes to home protection. Um, a one degree uh, increase in temperature, average summertime temperature, results in about 35% more area burned. Now in Montana it was significantly more. Uh, why? It could be that we have more of these let burn fires in Montana. We have more remote fires where there's no homes. In California, it's really hard to find a fire that doesn't have homes. So I think what happens is they fight them more aggressively because there are more homes. Just an idea, something we need to explore. Um, temperature alone explained 28% of the variation in the cost to protect homes. Uh, in Montana, it was a bit higher. Maybe temperatures are less variable in California. Again, this, these are preliminary findings. We, we need to look at this more carefully. Um, let me give you an example. Um, so this is uh, on the Plumas National Forest. It's called the Elephant Fire, burned in August of 2009. Um, and in red, it uh, represents uh, residential development. Here's a good example of a, of a fire that doesn't have a whole lot of homes nearby. In fact, there were, there were 10 homes nearby. Um, and it underscores the importance. Preventing the development in the first place is the most cost-effective thing you can do. Um, with 10 homes within six miles of the perimeter of fire, the fire suppression costs on a daily basis were about half a million dollars. Um, if there had been 100 homes within six miles of the edge of the fire, the fire suppression costs would have doubled to a million dollars per day. Um, these are very preliminary findings in our California research, but it's starting to look like the lesson we're getting out of that particular research is once there is a subdivision next to a fire, they send in the firefighting crew, and an additional subdivision next to it doesn't make nearly as much of a difference in cost as when you have virgin land with no subdivisions. And the minute you start putting homes on, the costs grow exponentially. So the lesson is um, don't build to begin with. Um, so that's kind of the first part of my presentation. Um, now we're going to get into the whole topic of what do we do about this. Um, first of all, I, I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. I, I think this is going to get a lot worse. Um, we have given presentations to uh, the fire and aviation departments, at both the BLM and the Forest Service. Um, we've been in Washington, D.C. on five separate occasions. We've presented this to the Office of Management and Budget, the Congressional Research Service, uh, at the Department of the Interior, uh, the Office of Policy Analysis. Uh, we've been at a bunch of different fire conferences. Um, I, I don't think anybody is disagreeing with us that this is just the very beginning and it's going to get a lot worse. Um, unless what we do is talk about future residential development. And if you look at the literature on the wildland urban interface and you dig into this topic, you can find a stack of literature this tall, I have it in my office, and 99% of it deals with firewise. In other words, educating people that if you're going to have a home in a dangerous fire prone area, make sure you've got the right roofing material, make sure you have the right type of clearing around the home, make sure it's defensible, make sure that you, know, you thin it, those sorts of things. For existing developments, for that 14% that's been developed, I think that's extremely important. What I'm talking about is the future development where there are no homes yet. Um, so what can we do to keep these costs from continuing to go up? So we, we wrote a white paper, we came up with 10 ideas. Um, each of these ideas, we um, first of all, we said, let's, let's start by talking about this subject. Let's start, start by talking about, should we be building homes 
where they eventually will be in danger of getting burnt down. Should we be building there? Um, let's, let's have that discussion. I know a lot of people are afraid to have that discussion, especially the federal agencies, because it crosses a boundary between federal lands and private lands, and nobody wants to tell private landowners what to do. We're saying, let's have the discussion. Um, so we threw out 10 ideas, and on each of these ideas, we lay out the pros and cons. Some of the ideas are very crazy. Some of them are politically naive. We don't care. We're throwing them all out there. We want to have the conversation. So this is what the conversation looks like. Um, the fundamental problem is that there's a lack of accountability. Those who build the homes and those local governments who permit the building of homes, they do not bear the cost of the firefighting. Most of the firefighting budget is paid for by the, the Forest Service, the BLM, FEMA, and departments like uh, DNRC here in Montana. So that's the fundamental problem underlying each one of these proposed solutions. So the first one is mapping. I mean, it seems like a really innocent one. Uh, politically, I don't think this is a tough one, or I didn't think it was a tough one. Um, I also don't think this would matter much. But I think it's important. It's probably a minimum requirement. Let's map where these really dangerous places are. Well, here you go. Critics give Ravalli County officials an earful on the wildfire response plan. One of the things that came out of the last um, legislat legislative efforts was um, a bill to actually map the fire prone areas. And um, this, of course, ran into all sorts of obstacles. Locals didn't like the idea. We also have here in California, it says a California city withheld data on fires. Officials kept, secret, kept a secret color-coded map showing the wildfire danger to various neighborhoods, and they kept it secret for fear that insurance companies would use the information to justify raising rates or dropping policies. So there's al already, you can see, even the easiest, simplest idea is running into problems. The, not, the other one is education. Um, a lot of people have no idea how much protecting homes costs. So studies like the ones we're doing, we're also doing one in, in Oregon, um, we're hoping will head, help shed some light on this. Um, the third idea is redirect some federal aid towards land use planning. Um, a lot of counties need help with a variety of things. Uh, zoning, zoning, transferable development rights, incentives for cluster development. There's a whole toolbox, land use planning toolbox, in a lot of small communities. Some of the most intelligent, most qualified people are in the Forest Service and BLM offices. Um, they have GIS capability. They're very educated. They're very capable folks. What if we redirect some of their efforts towards helping communities with land use planning? Um, sometimes you need to uh, review enabling legislation. What are we actually, what can we actually legally do in our county? Um, and that varies from state to state. Examples of successful land use planning. Um, facilitation and collaboration is really an important part in land use planning. Um, sometimes there's legal challenges and county commissioners are wondering, well, how do we resolve this? When is it a serious legal challenge? Well, we want to reject the subdivision because it's in a fire prone area and somebody threatens to sue us, we need some help, um, some partnerships. Um, there's a couple of uh, programs, the state and private forestry within the Forest Service does a lot of firewise education. Why not redirect some of their funds and some of their effort to also do land use planning? Or why not create a whole new program within the Forest Service or within FEMA dedicated to financial and technical assistance for land use planning? This is a big issue. It's $3 billion a year already. It doubled from a decade ago. It could get worse. Why not direct some money to preventing the problem to begin with? Idea number four, uh, cost share agreements. Uh, cost share agreements, uh, counties can enter into a cost share agreement with the Forest Service and the BLM, and they agree to share the cost of firefighting. Well, if you talk to the Forest Service people, a lot of them are just tearing their hair out very frustrated. I got examples from some people who said it's taken 20 years to negotiate a cost share agreement. Um, the GAO, uh, the Government Accountability Office, said the current framework for sharing costs insulates state and local governments from the increasing cost of protecting the wildland urban interface. Um, so why, if I was a county commissioner, why would I sign one of these cost share agreements to agree to pay for part of the cost? 
There's no incentive for me to do that. Um, well, how do we add some incentives? One might be um, you get more assistance, like from state and private forestry, if you've signed an agreement. Or let's add some disincentives. Um, you don't get as much assistance if you haven't signed an agreement. Um, or you withhold reimbursement. Some of the municipalities get reimbursed for some of their firefighting costs if they have any. You just say, look, we're not going to reimburse you if you don't have a cost share agreement signed. Um, you could also bill the county governments. The Forest Service could start handing out bills. So if you don't have a cost share agreement, we're just going to bill you. Um, or withhold secure rural school payments or PILT payments or other federal revenues. Like I said, some of these ideas are draconian and not very realistic. This might be one of those. Um, or administrative. Why not make these, integrate these master agreements into the land use planning process? Make it part of the Forest Service and the BLM's planning process. Or make it a requirement for them to sign on as a cooperating agency. So let's cost share agreements, idea number four. Um, idea number five is let's buy some of the most dangerous lands. Um, the Land and Water Conservation Fund, the Forest Legacy Program, the Community Forest and Open Space Conservation Program. The, Elder, the Land and Water Conservation Fund um, uses funds from offshore oil and gas drilling, and it can be used to buy hiking trails and wildlife habitat, um, public lands. Uh, one of the criteria for buying that land is not whether it's fire prone. Well, let's add that to one of the criteria for these funds. <clears throat> um, here's an example of land acquisition, the Montana Legacy Project, um, all the Plum Creek land that Plum Creek was um, selling county by county. We did an analysis for the county commissioners and each one of the counties where Plum Creek was gonna sell their land. This is land being bought by the Nature Conservancy, the Trust for Public Lands, in partnership with the state of Montana. And the state of Montana was being asked to pony up around $21 million. Well, what we did is we looked at what would happen if 100% of those that land, if it didn't go to conservation buyers, but instead was developed. If 100% of it was developed, the cost of protecting those homes from wildfire would be 74 million. If half of it was developed, the cost would be about 34, 37 million. That's at a density of one home per 160 acres. Um, it was actually cheaper for the state of Montana to just chip in and help buy that land. So sometimes, in some instances, it might actually be easier to buy the land than to do the firefighting. Um, this is another idea. This is the National Fire Insurance and Mortgage Program. Um, this has to do with flooding. Um, the communities can participate. They, get, um, they can get assistance, um, but it requires that you buy flood insurance. Um, it requires that the floodplain be mapped, and it's a federal responsibility to map that. Um, and also, if, if you're a mortgage lender, um, you may not lend money to somebody who's building or wants to buy a home in a floodplain. There's a few loopholes, you can, a few people are able to get around it, but it's hard. Uh, one of my colleagues re recently refinanced his house and he brought in the paperwork and showed me and it said, are you on a floodplain, yes or no? If you're on a floodplain, you can't get a loan. Um, so why not apply that to fire? Um, so provide disaster relief and education. Make it a federal responsibility to map the most fire prone lands. Um, require that communities adapt uh, management regulations and ordinances. Um, require mortgage lenders to make participation in the program a condition for a loan. You have to participate in this program. And um, you have to buy insurance. So that's one idea, um, borrowing from lessons learned from what we do with floodplains. Uh, okay, and then there's this, uh, this one, and this one comes up a lot when you travel around the country and talk about this. A lot of people say, you know what, let the market fix it by itself. What will happen is insurance companies, their premiums will go up high enough that it will discourage people from developing in these dangerous places. Um, Recently, uh, I was at a conference in D.C., and I was sitting next to a lobbyist for um, uh, State Farm Insurance. And he said, wildfire is not a big deal yet. He said, a big deal is leaky washing machine hoses. 
It happens all the time. It happens all over the country. That's a big deal. Wildfire, they're not concerned about yet. Um, so the idea would be that, well, let's, you know, these premiums would go up according to wildfire risk. So we thought that might be a good idea. Well, it turns out to be in most states that's illegal. You can't have differential rates based on risk. Um, and the reason is they're called fair plan, plan laws. And if you think about this, you don't want to have discrimination in terms of home insurance. If somebody lives in a slum, they live in a, in a an impoverished neighborhood, um, those people should be able to get insurance. So they have passed laws in several states, California being one of them, where they said, well, um, I, it's, you can't do that. You can't have differential rates. But they ha didn't have in mind that this might apply to fire. And we think there might be an exception. We might be able to have in some of these laws an exception for fire. Remember, it's not most of us. It's only 4% of the homes in the West. One out of four homes is a second home. They're mostly on large lots. These are not the poor we're talking about. Um, the other idea is to eliminate the federal subsidy. In other words, most of, these fund, most of the firefighting costs are paid for by the BLM and the Forest Service and FEMA. If I was an insurer, I'd be pretty happy about that. It means much of the risk is paid for by the federal taxpayer. Um, there is some evidence before the fair plan, fair plan laws were uh, enacted in California that insurance rates were starting to go up and it was acting as a deterrent for fu future development. So there is some evidence that this might work some. Um, this is a, a fire. Uh, this photo I showed you earlier, this is the Four Mile Fire outside of Boulder, Colorado. Uh, $214 uh, million in insurance costs. This burnt uh, just last year. Um, If you look at what insurance companies the year before spent on hail damage, it amounted to $1.4 billion. So this puts it into perspective whether this is a big issue for insurance companies or not. Um, hail is a much bigger deal in Colorado than fire. Um, this is Carol Walker, the executive director of the Rocky Mountain Insurance Information. She says, while wildfire losses are a concern, they aren't really a pattern yet. They aren't enough to drive out private insurers like hurricanes in Florida have. So I don't think allowing, waiting for the insurance premiums to go up is, is the solution. Uh, this gets us to zoning. Um, you know, can counties and municipalities just basically say, look, that's a really dangerous place. You may not build that. We're going we're gonna to zone it so that you can't build there. Um, the Forest Service keeps a computerized record of city and county ordinances related to fire. Uh, it's a searchable database. Um, we spent a bunch of time on that. We also did a lot of interviewing and calling. We found two examples, Napa County, California and Skagit County, Washington, that have in place ordinances that prevent people from building in fire prone areas. That's it. That's all we could find. Um, so this isn't happening yet. Um, and then we have uh, mortgage interest deductions. Um, when you own a home, you can deduct the interest um, from your federal taxes. This is a law that's in place to encourage home ownership. Well, why do that for uh, new homes that are built in the wildland urban interface? Um, if you think of what's being built in the wildland urban interface, the, the occupancy of land is about 3.2 uh, acres per person compared to half an acre per person. It's six times as much. So the per person footprint is six times larger than outside of the WUI. Um, we're expecting about 2.2 million uh, new homes in the WUI by 2030. It's a 40% increase. Um, we're losing about 6,000 acres of open space a day. Um, it's costing $3 billion a year. Probably about half of that goes to protecting the homes, maybe more. Only 4% of the homes in the West are in the wildland urban interface. And one out of five homes is a second home. Why are we giving these folks a tax break? Um, and you should imagine me presenting this at the 
National Home Builders Association. They're pretty happy with me. Um, well, you can put some bounds on it. You can say, well, do it for new homes um, and new homes that are in really dangerous places. So it requires that mapping idea first. So you've been warned this is a very dangerous place. And if you build a new home there, you don't qualify for this. The tenth idea, this wasn't even our idea. In fact, a bunch of these ideas came from the fire and aviation people within the agency who, who said, boy, you know, we, we'd love to be able to say this publicly, but we can't. We'd lose our jobs, but maybe you can stick your neck out and say these things. Um, this came from the head of fire and aviation at one of the agencies. And he basically said, why don't you just cut our firefighting budget in half? He says, trust me, we'll bill the states and the states will bill the counties. Then suddenly you've got a county commissioner looking at a new planning map for a potential new subdivision. They're looking at it and they're gonna go, can we afford the firefighting costs? And that's not the situation we have right now. Um, you could put some bounds on it. You can say, well, under what conditions? Well, if it's in a well-known, well-documented risk area, if the federal agency has given ample warning, and if the county commissioners know of the risk and they permit the development anyway, under those circumstances, bill them. Um, <clears throat> now, remember I was telling you the Montana legislature asked for this study. Um, shortly after the study, there were 40 bills um, having to do with wildfire. Only a handful of them um, had to do with curtailing future growth in the wildland urban interface. And the only significant one that really passed was the mapping one. So faced with all this evidence and all this information, why did the Montana legislature not do much? Well, they don't have an incentive to. Most of the costs are still borne by the federal taxpayer. That's a good example of misaligned incentives. There is no disincentive to building in the wrong place. And there's no incentive for anybody in the Montana legislature to stick their neck out as long as the federal government keeps paying the bulk of the bill. So that's why this last idea might actually, even though it sounds draconian, it might actually be the most viable one. Um, so that's the bulk of my presentation. I want to open it to questions and discussions. Um, all of the, everything I've told you is on our website. We've got a whole part of our website devoted to wildfire. Um, the technical study we did for the Montana legislature is there. Um, we have uh, a resource where, whereby you can look at state by state and county by county, look at the wildland urban interface, how much of it has been developed, how much of it are second homes, what's the potential for new development. Um, so uh, have fun with that. Um, and then the, <coughs> the white paper is called Solutions to the Rising Costs of Fighting Fires in the Wildland Urban Interface. Um, yeah, you have a question. First one is how much was the effective uh, regulation out of major logging industry affect the fire? In other words, did the removal of any logging activities increase the fire risk? So in other words, you lost that money, and did this also contribute to create a fire? So uh huh. There. The right. Question is, you should have something that sells don't get much property. The, uh, they do get property taxes, they do. But not to equivalent to the money spent on defending certain. The costs exceed the taxes, yes. That's direct taxation. How much is indirect taxation? In other words, the business they bring, the... Uh, oh, that sort of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so the first question had to do with how much of the rise in firefighting costs has to do with forest management practices, the lack of logging, the lack of thinning, too much growth in the understory. Um, uh, the head of fire and aviation at the Forest Service likes to say that there's three reasons firefighting costs have gone up. They're all W words. Wood, there's too much of it, he says. Weather, it's getting warmer. And the wooey, the wildland urban interface. Um, like I said before, I'm not a forester. I can't speak to the, the, the you know, lack of thinning and how much that has contributed to, to firefighting costs. Our interest in this is very narrow. And it has to do with, with 
future development in the wildland urban interface. The second question had to do with these cost of services studies. Uh, correct me if I get, get this wrong, but you wanted to know whether these people who live in these far-flung subdivisions also have other benefits to the community. Indirect taxes. Indirect taxes, sure. Just the, uh, the property taxes. Sure. Sales taxes the county had in, yeah. uh, increased business. Going in. Yeah, anytime you have new people in a community, there's new economic activity, they're buying stuff. And it, no, because it wouldn't matter where they live. They would still be spending that, right? So it wouldn't matter. It has nothing to do with the pattern of development. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, the Australians uh, do things a little differently sometimes. They uh, uh, stay at their house. They don't get uh, they don't get told to leave. The fire is coming. And right. They, they are responsible to protect their own place. And I know the Forest Service has looked into this some. Uh, I'm not sure it works with climate change because the fires are hotter right. and so forth. But uh, that would be an interesting comparison to see what the costs are there versus here. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would love to do this in Australia. I, I know last year the uh, stay and defend, I don't know if that's what it's called, but the stay and defend policy. Um, Forest Service was talking about a lot because there was one incident where quite a few people died because they did stay and defend, but the fire was so big that it, it really killed quite a few people. So, um, but it certainly is an incentive for doing you know, what you want to do if there is already is a subdivision, which is you know, clear brush and do some thinning and make sure the fire doesn't get too close. But I don't know if that would prevent people from building in the first place. It's an interesting question. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, on one of your slides you said there was a 200% increase in residential development in Montana. And so given that ratio of the, the west average, that right. would assume about 10% then are located on the, the buoy. And then is that one to five amenity home ownership, second home ownership to permanent residential the same? in Montana as it was for kind of that national average? Ah, good question. Um, this resource that we, we have here, you can actually look at, that was a, that's, that was a west-wide average, but it, it's a little different in Montana, a little different in Wyoming, and you could look at it state by state, yeah. and, and you can look at it county by county. But that, yeah, that was a west-wide average. Yeah, yeah. Yes? Do you think that, uh, price of gas, it goes up to five or $6. Would that have any effect on development? Good question. Would people drive, would be willing to drive less? What do you think? Well, you know, as a landlord, I'm starting to see people move in from only five miles out of town to, because of the cost of gas now. Right. But, you're talking about probably more wealthier clientele or building that maybe the price of gas isn't that big of a factor to them. But I, I still think it would have some impact. I didn't know if your model took into account the price of energy to it. Yeah, no, we didn't do any predictive modeling at all, but that, that is an interesting question. I, you know, for most of us, that's a big part of our budget, but for some people, it might not be. <laughs> Uh, yeah, good question. I, I wouldn't know. Yeah, yeah. Good point, though. Um, yes? Um, so you mentioned that the two counties that have zoning regulations in place are Skagit County in Washington and Napa. And I know um, Skagit is really, you know, it's Pacific Northwest and they wet. Um, so my question for that is, um, do you know if those areas of high risk fires, if there's a lot of them, because yeah. I mean, it's probably not comparable to what you have in a place like Colorado or Montana, and right. like what kind of initiatives did those places have to take to get those? They, they're both high risk areas, but the story is different. Um, in, in Skagit, they have a, a development zone whereby you get full services and full protection. And if you live outside of that zone, there's no guarantee of any protection. 
um, no guarantee of first responder protection, and it's also very hard to get a permit. In, in Napa County, they had two ordinances. The first ordinance was, they just basically said, these are the most fire prone areas you can't build there. But then came a second one, preventing any building there um, in the same place, but it was driven by the owners of the vineyards who didn't want to see sprawl encroaching on their vineyards. So um, initially it was for a fire reason, but eventually it ended up being uh, to protect the vineyards from encroaching development. Which goes to show you if you have a powerful local political actor, things can happen. Yeah. Um, you know, it's really interesting. Um, the, the biggest response I get is everybody wants to talk about thinning vegetation and roofing material and construction material and um, ordinances that have to do with how to make existing developments more fireproof. There's no such thing, but, but at least reduce the risk. Um, and hardly anybody wants to talk about stopping future development. The main reason is b because of property rights. People go, oh, property rights. And they throw their hands up, right? But think of the last idea. Cut the agency's firefighting budget in half. Start billing the counties. If I was a county commissioner, that th that's the political cover I'd want, right? Because the, if you think about Western environmental policy, the, 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 the tail that wags the dog is the budget of the county commission. If you can incentivize, incentivize the budget of the county commission towards the sorts of things that we're talking about here, I think you've won a big part of the battle. So if I was a county commissioner and I'd say, well, you can't build her because it's a high fire risk, I'd get confronted with a property rights argument. But if I go there and say, wait a second, my job is to balance the budget. I've got to plow roads, I've got to pay for the schools, I've got all these things I need to pay for. If you build there, it's going to cost this many millions of dollars. What do you want me to not fund? Should we not fund the middle school? Should, should we not plow roads anymore? Um, that's the political cover that county commissioners have not had. Um, and they haven't had that because federal agencies just every year just keep piling on money. That's, that's the response I'm getting, property rights. Um, I'll tell you another thing, and this is um, probably not something any of you will, 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 will ask of, but there's just seven of us in Bozeman. We're, we're a pretty small group. Um, this is a national issue. So right away we got advice. People said, well, you gotta partner with somebody. Because you know, what, what are seven guys in Bozeman gonna do, right? Are you gonna change national policy, just, just a small group like this? So first thing we did, we went to Washington. We, we, when we first started the study, by the way, we met with all the fire and aviation people. We met with Office of Management and Budget. We met with Congressional Research Service and told them we were gonna be doing this. We also met with the smart growth community. And we said, hey, if there was ever a silver bullet against sprawl, this is it, right? Let's, nothing doing. They're not on this topic. With the Obama, Obama administration in office, there's a real opportunity to change transportation policy. And that's what they're focused on. We could not get their attention on this. We couldn't get anybody's attention on this. Our biggest supporters are the fire and aviation staff within the agencies, ironically. So, any other questions? Yes? Who decides which areas are fire prone and how dangerous they are? I mean, is it going to be a collective grouping thing or is it like, be like U.S. Forest Service or? Yeah in conjunction with the counties and... Good, good point. Um, so y years ago in California, they passed a law and CAL FIRE has to actually map um, areas. They have color-coded maps at the county level, uh, color-coded yellow, orange, and red by fire risk. Um, in that case, it's a state agency. Um, we also have state agency in Montana who, for whom it's now a responsibility. but. Um, when you go into the Forest Service's office in D.C., you can see maps on fire risk. Um, they have people who are already working on this. 
Um, I think it should be a federal responsibility. Um, and I think it's, it's not an easy undertaking, of course. You know, mapping fire risk is, is hard. But you can start by mapping like they did in California, just color-coded yellow, orange, red. Um, so the answer is it depends. Uh, right now, the responsibility legally is in a handful of states that have passed those laws. There is no yet any call at the federal level to do this. Even though they're doing this mapping on the side, they haven't shared that with anybody. Those are public maps. Yeah. Oh, this is a pretty long-term question, but let's say that we do curve um, people sprawling in the WMI. Eventually, we're going to run out of real estate to put people. I mean, this is a major long-term right. thing. I mean, what, what's even going to happen to that wild land then? You know, if we can't develop it, it's right. just going to sit out there, it's all going to be conserved. I mean, at some point, we have to get to use these resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, you have to put this into perspective. We, we um, again, these aren't very many people doing this. It's not most of us. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to the Netherlands, but, you know, it's a country with 13, 14 million people, about a third the size of Montana. 85% uh, of it is open space. Um, they made a decision as a, as a nation um, they have an agricultural heritage, they protect their farms. You can't build on them. It, it's working. So it's a cultural mindset too. I think, I think it is. I, you know, I, I think y you have to think in terms of living closer together. <laughs> like my cousins in Holland all live in little row houses and little apartments, you know. Nobody has acreage. Um, that's, you know, thinking 50 years into the future, right? Are we going to live more like that? or more sprawled out. Um, that's a choice. Um, but there's a cost associated with it. All I'm saying is realign the incentives. Have those who make the decision to build out in the woods and also those who permit those new subdivisions, hold them accountable for the costs. If we still have sprawl after that, fine. At least I'm not paying for it. Really significant findings, and um, you're, you're not really getting a lot of traction. It sounds like with a lot of potential partners. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about how it's been received and yeah. where the next steps might be for your Okay, so the so the target for this is Congress. Mm -hmm. We don't have any local. I mean, everybody were when we wrote this, our 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 tar target was a staffer working on a key committee for a key member of Congress who's dealing with this subject. Um, Diane Feinstein in California is, a, is really big on this topic, okay? That's why we did the California study, because we thought, well, okay, she's not paying attention to the Montana study, now let's do one in her backyard, okay? Um, you have to think, you know, there, last year wasn't a big fire year. Uh, Congress deals with the crisis of the moment. If there's a giant fire year, you're more likely to get traction in Congress. Um, what we wanted is, is if, if I was a congressional staffer, I'd say, boy, this is great because these guys, they just looked at 10 options and the pros and cons of all of them. They basically did my homework for me, you know? Um, that's how it's being received by, by staffers in Congress and the Senate so far. But they're also saying their bosses are telling them this is not an important topic right now. And, it, and it, you line it up with other topics, it, it isn't. Compared to the recession, this doesn't float to the surface at all. Uh, but it will eventually again. Um, yeah. Yes. Has the has the notion of, of just plain affordability ever come into? I mean, okay, three three billion dollars a year isn't you know small. I mean, compared to our national deficit, what's a few Probably. billion more? But. Um, <clears throat> But I mean, at some point, do you think the federal government will, will ever run out of funding to, you know, especially as more, you know, land near near public lands are developed? Do you think there ever be an instance where they simply won't have the resources to do that? Where they won't be able to have the money to go and do the firefighting? It's a great question. That's certainly what we're hearing within the agencies. 
Um, I don't know if you followed this, but last year the, the Congress passed the Flame Act. Um, what happened, the way firefighting was funded within the agencies is they had to rob from other departments. So if they ran out of firefighting funds, they had to borrow from other departments. So other departments within the Forest Service were getting raided all the time. Um, Congress passed a law whereby they set aside a certain amount of money for very large fires, that that wouldn't happen with the biggest fires. Um, so that got rid of the, 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 you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul issue. But the escalating costs, especially with climate change, has everybody really worried. Um, it's already about half of the agency's budget. It could easily be the agency's entire budget. Um, that's, if I was at the Forest Service, I'd be really worried about that, and they are. That's why our biggest champions on this topic are Forest Service staff um, at the Washington level. Yeah. One more question. Yes. Um, it kind of seems like by default, uh, the public or the federal taxpayers are kind of paying the burden of the cost for firefighting in the buoy. Um, has there been any public surveys about whether or not the general taxpayer sees that as an acceptable use of the tax dollars? Because uh -huh. um, it seems like you need, you need public support somehow. It seems like a lot of the incentives are definitely not going to come from local people. Or at least yeah, like a lot of them I haven't seen anything like that, but I've, I've heard some very powerful arguments for why we should keep the subsidy going. Um, one is, think of Katrina. Fires are considered natural disasters. They're not considered part of the ecosystem. People just don't think of them that way. They are part of the ecosystem. They're part, we've always had fires. We always will have fires. We, we're raised with fires, that's, that's how our ecosystems evolved. Um, but that's not how the general public sees it. They see fires the way they look at a hurricane. Um, and you know, after Katrina, it's no longer an option for the federal government to not show up. That's a pretty strong sentiment. So this is not an easy battle. Um, at the same time, the opportunity right now is Congress is in a cost-cutting mood. And this might, ironically, best be the best opportunity we have right now. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't a big fire season last year, so nobody's too worried about it. But maybe this coming year, if it's a big fire season, it's in the news again, maybe at that point it'll happen once again. But good point. Yep. Please join me in thanking Ray Rath. Thank you.